our COVID impact and assessments webinar series with NCME. Today, our focus is going to be on creating challenges. And this is our second webinar of the 10 webinar series. Um, we've scheduled for the, so for the next eight, nine weeks on Thursdays from 3.30 to 5 o'clock, you can always dial in to our webinars um, that are going to focus on the various issues around COVID's impact on assessments. Now, before we start diving into the, um, into the session, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our facilitator and panelists. My name is Ye Tong. I am the current NCME uh, virtual president. Um, for my, um, I'm gonna be the facilitator for today's session and for my real day job, I work at Pearson. I am the vice president of the psychometric and research team. And in my work, I oversee our teams that uh, work on both the K-12 assessments as well as our licensure certification exams. Um, our first presenter today is going to be Bob Lee from Massachusetts. Bob? You're still muted, Bob. The most often repeated statement this, this year has been you're still muted. Um, hi, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to introduce myself very briefly. Uh, a lot of you probably have seen me in one shape or another. I've been at the department for 25 years um, in one, one position or another, uh, working with the accountability and assessment systems in Massachusetts since 2000. And I've been involved with PARC uh, across many, many different phases of the uh, no Child from No Child Left Behind through through Race to the Top and lately through ESSA. And uh, my children are now grown. One of them has become a school teacher. And I spend my, my evenings bowling and playing softball when we're allowed out of the house. All right, thank you, Bob. Um, our next presenter, presenters. Um, so Sarah Kyson is one of the presenters, but she won't be able to join us today. She has a family matter she has to take care of. She is a research science, senior research scientist with Pearson, and, I'm, um, and she also teaches at the University of Pittsburgh. So um, now let's go to Jen. Hey, I'm Jen Beimers. I'm a psychometrician with Pearson. I've been with Pearson for a little over 12 years now. And prior to that, I earned degrees from Nebraska, North Carolina, and Iowa. And my research interests include automated scoring and online testing. Thank you, Jen. Amanda? Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Wolkowitz. I'm a senior psychometrician with Alpine Testing. Um, I work primarily, primarily with professional credentialing organizations. Um, I live in St. Louis. I'm I have three girls who will all be ending their virtual school here during the session. So I will hope that it still remains quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same prayer I have for myself too. All right, last but not least, Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Cohen, a professor emeritus in educational measurement statistics from the University of Iowa. I uh, spent 20 years uh, on the faculty at the University of Iowa and 16 years at working for ACT. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, I want to give you all an overview of the session today. So we have a total of four presentations. We'll have Bob go first, followed by Jen and Amanda, and Mike will do some discussion of the different presentations you'll hear today. Um, the discussion will be on the various challenges we see in equating this year in this um, COVID impact year. But then also we're gonna focus on some of the suggested solutions in both K-12 as well as credentialing assessments. If you think about COVID and how it's impacting um, assessments, you can think about, um, we have testing windows being expanded because of COVID. There are some test blueprint changes potential testing population probably are shifting because of COVID learning losses, as well as testing conditions, uh, be it uh, in-person testing versus remote proctored exams. So testing conditions also vary. And those, of course, all contribute to how the professionals will be doing the equating analysis. 
So our various presentations, we touch upon the challenges we see and what we see as potential solutions. Now, just a little bit of context setting. So Jen will, Bob and Jen will be focusing on the K-12 assessments and Amanda will be focusing on credentialing exams. So with the K-12 assessment, one thing I wanted to share with you all is uh, CCSSO recently did a survey in December with um, testing directors across different states and they were able to have 30 states and territories participating in the survey. They were able to share with us a summary of those results, nothing specific about states, but a summary of uh, different plans. And so in the summary, what's gonna be relevant for today is are seeing out of the 39 states, about 19 states will be having an extended testing window. Eight of them will be administering a shorter version of their assessment, and five states are currently thinking remote administration option. Now, as you all know, nothing with COVID is set in stone, everything is still fluid, things could potentially change, but these are some of the conditions we're facing today. Now, going on to the next um, Going on to the next um, licensure certification exams, again, because of COVID, many testing centers within the country across the globe have shut down for periods of the time. And also when they open back up, it's at 50% or less capacity because of social distancing requirements. And we have also seen credential exams moving um, to remote proctoring settings and so these all are impacting the data we collect and how we want to do equating. There has also been a lot of test design modification considerations as well. And the context around credential exams is a pre-equating model is the, is the dominant model uh, with this particular type of assessments because of the reporting requirement. So keep these different contexts in mind as you listen to our presenters and think about all the issues our practitioners have to deal with, with assessment and when they do equating. So now um, let the fun begin. And so I am going to um, invite Bob to do his presentation once I get the... Thank you, yeah. Um, we can advance to the first slide, thanks. Um, there, that, that's the road ahead right now for us, for state assessment um, directors and, and, uh, and chief, chief analysts. We've never needed to get across that road, no, road more and we've never faced so many different circumstances. Um, we, we've had an obviously enormous disruptions in the, in the uh, instructional um, services that, that were offered in K-12, some states, and we, and we were among the most, um, we, we were among the states that shut down the most during the, during last spring's, um, uh, what, what we treated as a snow, as an extended snow day turned into a, uh, a 60 day uh, disruption. And we struggled to, after our initial guidance to uh, not cover any new material, uh, started seem, seeming like it was a little old. We, we rushed in at the end of May to, to try to get, to get our, our classes back on track. The same happened when we tried to get back to school this year. We, we, there were a lot, lots of questions about whether we would, what, what, how we should attend, how many days we should shorten the school year so people could be, could be trained in the new technologies. We've had uh, students moving back and forth between instructional modes, obviously. Um, I think the same is true in all states. And now as we plan to, to return, as, as, as the vaccines um, are, are, are on the horizon, our teachers are, are, are among the first that are gonna be vaccinated in Massachusetts. We still have a lot of, um, you know, there's, it's still very slow in the rollout. And, when, and just when, we, when students get back, uh, we're, we would need to start testing them and that, that's not gonna go over well. <laughs> and we're expecting participation rates will vary um, we, we typically have 99% participation. I don't think it's going to be feasible for us to get high participation. I don't think we're, um, we are one of the eight states that has already decided to go with a shorter version of our test. And we're trying to avoid being one of the five states that, um, that allows home testing because we've, we have found no evidence that it will, that it would be successful. So we're trying to map all that together. If you, you want to advance the next 
the next slide, please. Yay. Um, we typically use a post equating method, and we're not we're not uh, at all confident as as we've been planning for for the disruptions that we um, that I've just described. We are expecting that the data this year is going to be very different, and we can't rely on any of the parameters. So we're going with pre equated solutions for our tests um, based on the two thousand. 19 or earlier field test data that we might have had. And we're just going to live with that, but knowing, knowing that there's been a, you know, there, this is, a, this is a, a very different approach than we typically have. There's obviously opportunity to learn gaps that are going to appear. And um, as, one, as some of our TAC members have pointed out this year, there are always opportunity to learn gaps. They're just very different this year. And why, why should they, why should we treat them any differently this year than others? But to maintain our scale, we believe we have to use this pre-equated solution. And if the most important thing is to, is to measure accurately um, what the learning loss is, we certainly don't want to curtail the tests. Move to the next slide, please. Um, obviously, in addition to the, the gap in testing, there's a gap in the, in the instruction that students received. Um, I, I like this map that I, that I picked up, by, I believe it was from a study done by, by Zern, um, showing online, online interaction. Um, so right, when, right when, uh, when they compared the student interaction online from March 15th till May to a, to a baseline level, some states showed very, very different um, reactions. We, we're, we were in Massachusetts, we were one of these uh, states where the students actually logged in less to their online teaching and learning systems when, this, when the shutdown took place. And we were surrounded by states um, like, like New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, where, the increase, where, where they increased their interactions because you know, school was closed down. The only way they could interact was online. Um, we saw this, this and many other reasons um, to, to believe that we were gonna see different results than we typically do in Massachusetts. And as we look at our own districts, we saw that some of our districts like, like Brookline has been famous. They have been one of the, one of the um, least likely to be engaged in person. And some of our other districts that have traditionally been low achieving districts have had more interactions with their students, but that's certainly not universal. We don't know what we don't know, in other words. It's, it's uh, it, and, and what, what the opportunity to learn gaps are, we, we're, un, we're very uncertain about. Next slide, please. Um, I told you that we were planning to give a half a test. We weren't planning so far in advance to give a half a test to our students when they come back that we were able to develop balanced forms, however. So what we, what we typically do is we have two days of math testing, two days of English testing, two days of science testing. So if you're in one of the, if you're in fifth or eighth grade, we were gonna ask people to give, to give six days of testing right when they come back to school and even without put, even without floating that idea, we knew that we that we couldn't um, really expect schools to dedicate that much time to testing when they came back. But we, like like I said, we hadn't developed the forms to be balanced. It wasn't like we could we could rearrange them quickly. So we have um, some situations, and I'll show you a couple of examples later where where the half of a test that we're giving to the students doesn't contain a balance of the content. Of the content, we are, you know, even if, even though the the two tests together show we'll we'll, we'll assess the, the full curriculum, we're a little concerned. We're going to be spiraling at the at the at the student level within classrooms, so it'll balance out in the aggregate. But for individuals, this is going to pose some interesting problems um, when estimating certainly what their uh, what their abilities are. Next, next, please. This is one of those uh, uh, data points I was going to show you. Um, one of the more extreme um, cases is where we have in the third and fourth grade test, we only have one essay. That essay appears in one of the days, one of the sessions. It's not in both sessions. And we are going to have um, some students who have, a, have an essay, you know, half their test is going to be the essay. And for other students, uh, though they're going to have one hand scored open response item, um, they're not going to have, um, they're, they're not going to have the same, the same content, basically. Same is going to happen if you move to the next slide um, in, in, in other subjects where we have modules, for instance, there's a, there's a life sciences module in one session, a physical sciences module in the other. 
the, 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 two, the two different forms are going to be unbalanced. And in the, though those, those two sessions look similar, the diagnostic information or any information we provide back is going to be a little unbalanced. And the difficulties are not necessarily um, likewise balanced. So that's going to pose a problem for us. Next slide, please. Um, this, of course, shows the opportunity to learn that I've already alluded to this. Um, th these are the data that we've had. Uh, we are collecting the data at the student level and at the school level in Massachusetts. So we will be able to know of more or less officially whether students were receiving in-person instruction hybrid or remote or whether they transferred out. Um, and we're going to see very, um, this is going to be uneven. It's going to be fascinating to study. I'm not sure what, it, what it's going to do to our equating. But uh, you can think about that and give us your, your two cents on it if, if you can. Next slide, please. Uh, we conducted a simulation study as we prepared for this, looking at what's it going to be like if you give half the test. You, what, you know, what are the results going to look like? And um, this, this is with our, our contractor, uh, Shi, Shi Wang of, of Cogni, I put this together, who was, who was, by the way, in China while well, she did this. She, she went um, home to China to visit her relatives. Um, in the adjacent pro, um, uh, province to, uh, I think she was adjacent to, to Wuhan. And, and uh, she, she ended up staying there for 11 months away from her husband and her, and her home because uh, she was unable to return, but she was able to do a lot of good research for us. Uh, in this study, if you want to move to the next slide, she showed what, what the results would look like for different uh, end sizes. Um, like if you, if you did these half tests, we, we found in general that the standard errors were about 40% larger, I think it was, um, than, than, than typical. So we, we, we knew a little, we knew that they would work pretty well, especially as you started moving towards schools that had 60 or 120 test takers, that cutting the testing time in half was going to, it was still going to work out pretty well when we aggregated the results. But if you move to the next set of slides, let's see. Yeah, that's because um, let's let's go ahead go ahead to the to the next one. Um, at the at the individual level, in some cases where we had unbalanced tests and the, and, the, and some the the student level standard errors were larger for some students. And not only that, we had different levels of precision. So like one of our one of our TAC members, Andrew, I see is is on is on the on the session talks about what happens when you have different levels of precision for different students. How do you contend with that? Well, um, we're right in the middle of that right now, and um, we're, we, we, we need to figure out how to, how to present that and how to convey that to people, with the alternative being that we don't give assessments at all. Next slide, please. Um, and additional things that we have to think about, um, when, we, when we present our data uh, typically to schools, we not only provide achievement levels, but we, we do provide a, a, a second a, a, a growth score. In, in our case, we use the student growth percentile model. And one of the ways that we can convey whether that score is surprising or not, whether a student you know, with a given score um, appears to have progressed the same as other students who scored like them in the past, or whether it was high or low, that um, is part of our, of our workshop work with, with different um, people using the, using the test. And uh, it does reveal something. I mean, you, you look at some of these results that um, Damian Biedebender put this, this uh, together using STAR data from students who took, who took uh, their interim assessments in the fall and compared, compared to last fall, 2019 to 2020. And you see, what you can see is, is what I'm expecting we're gonna, we're gonna find is that some students are actually growing at a high rate. It's a lot fewer than typical. Like you, you look at the worst case scenario, the, or the most dramatic case, maybe grade five um, math in this in this case. Half the students grew at a low at, at, at a low rate, um, and compared to twenty one percent that grew at a high rate. But those twenty one percent are we're going to see some some real spreading of, of, of students, and it's not always where we expected it. Uh, Damien was looking at. Uh, across, I think he did a detailed study of the grade six students using that STAR data and found it was the most advanced students that showed the lowest growth. Um, and that, that was a surprise just within that data set. I'm not sure it's generalized, but I hear people say, I know exactly what the results are gonna say all the time. And I'm always like, I'm always in the position, I, how do you know that? How do you know what, what, what to expect? Um, I'm hearing the, you know, some of the most 
dysfunctional school um, transitions have been in in the school districts that are that have been run um, with the greatest uh, <laughs> with the greatest coordination in the past. They've they've been the ones that have struggled the most because they were used to doing things a certain way. And I, I don't know that we're always going to see the same thing that, that we always see and that it's going to be worse for the poorest. It's probably going to be worse for the poorest students with the access to the least technology. But I think we're going to be surprised by some of these results. And sometimes breaking the results down by what the change scores are is helpful, especially when those change scores can be rooted in historical data. In this case, Damien compared the growth percentiles to the historical growth patterns from 2016 to 2019. So a student who's growing at a normal rate this year may, may be growing at a low rate. And I think he was finding that uh, students grew at the 35th percentile in math across the board. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna move, I'm gonna skip this one, we don't have time. Um, when we look at growth, one of the problems we've had from over the last five years that we put a lot of emphasis on in my, in my state is the fact that the growth has been the lowest for the students who need it the most. And this year we're gonna see, I can anticipate we're gonna see students who are falling year, a year or more behind. And I would define a year, falling a year behind, meaning if you had to have, if you're, if you're so far behind that you're gonna need among the best instruction that we see in the state to catch up, like high growth. So if you're, if you're so far, if you're, if you're in a place where to compare your results to, um, to past results, it would take you a year of excellent instruction to catch up to where you were before the pandemic, then you're then you're a year behind. If it's going to take two years or three years, you're, you're, you've definitely suffered, experienced some learning loss, and the same typical in, inputs are not likely to provide um, provide that outcome. When we look at what typically happens in Massachusetts, and this is this is you know as we watch students from grade three through six, um, the students, especially the high achieving students, like high achieving African American and and Latina students, um, they are very, they're the least likely to be in classrooms that have high growth. They're the ones that are most likely to need it now. Um, we, we, see, we see seven times as many advanced students falling out of the advanced range between third and sixth grade in a typical year, or I'm sorry, in a typical cycle. Um, if the, among Latin and Latinx and uh, and African-American students as we do among Asian and white students in Massachusetts. Is that gonna be even worse this year? Are we gonna need different kinds of programs and supports for them? Um, because I, I'll, I'll move to the next slide now, yay. When we look back at, at, the, at, the, at the students who have bad years, um, you know, we have a lot of longitudinal data in Massachusetts from, from 2001 through 2019, I have, I have data, I have income data, I have college graduation data, I have every MCAS score in that, in that era. I can look at kids who in 2003 were third graders and, see, and who had a bad year in 2004. And in my, that little table I put together on the left shows among the, among the students who had a good, who, whose scores went up by a standard deviation or more, 60% who were proficient graduated from college by 2018. I look at the kids who had bad years over on the, 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 two, the two columns on the right, their, their, their chances, their, 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 not their chances, 40% of them, of the students who had been proficient who showed a half a standard deviation drop, um, they had a 20% decline in their propensity to graduate from college 15 years later. And those whose, those whose scores went down a standard deviation were half as likely as those who didn't um, to, and I've done this. I've done this study. There are five thousand students in that in that last column, and among those five thousand students, only thirty percent of them graduated from, um, who were proficient, graduated from college. Same same at, at needs improvement. None of the students who were warning who had a big drop. There weren't very many of them in that category. Um, and I've done this same study with eighth graders. I've done the same study with sixth graders. It's the same. If you have a bad year, especially if your parents didn't go to, didn't go to college, you are you're knocked off your you're knocked off your uh, academic game. It's very difficult to recover. And I, I need to be able to provide some sort of contextual information to people to signal, to, to signal program. We have, we have large, large money coming from the stimulus. We have to direct some of that money for programming for students so that they can get back on track academically and not suffer the long-term consequences that we've seen um, that happened over the last 20 years with that data. Um, Yay, yeah, please move um, to the next slide. 
And uh, I'm, I'm going to just cut back at this. I've, I've spoken about this, the possibility of talking about a year's, like, like a student who's a year behind is a student who's going to need a year of high growth to catch up to where they are. That's, that's one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the ideas I'd like to advance, um, working with some of that growth data. But at the same time, <laughs> connecting this to the, uh, to the points I made earlier, we have less data to use to make those estimations of who, of who showed, a, of who's behind. And it's more reliable at the aggregate level than it is at the student level. So that's our conundrum. Next slide, please. Um, all this is against a background of there's um, within a week of schools shutting down, um, our teachers association was demanding a three year moratorium on testing. And this was very similar at the same around that same period. Um, there's this stop the testing logic that like we don't want to know because we don't want people to we don't want people to jump to the wrong conclusion that we're doing a bad job in our in schools, and it it, it the politics have been almost impossible to work with. It, there's there the the only the only group that seems to support testing right now are the school committee members and parents in Massachusetts, and and a handful of veteran politicians that have been through these wars before. But we are facing opposition and legislation at a constant level it says we do not want to test. We don't want to know where we are and we don't want to know where we've been and we don't want to get involved in, in uh, any kind of discussion of how much academic um, losses were made, at least at a, using a standardized test from the state. So that, that makes, it, uh, makes it appealing not to give tests right now because, it's, uh, because there are so many people fighting us on that point. Um, next slide, please. And that, I believe, is the same slide. I think we went, we went back. Um, to, to wrap up, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask our panelists and everybody to, to, to join in the discussion. Um, relatively little is known. Like we, we have relatively little information right now, even coming up from the schools and from our interim assessments, about what the extent of learning loss is. We're bracing for large amounts of it. Um, we are also receiving funding to support large amounts of uh, support services, um, both directed at, for the academic and, and uh, social and emotional um, deficits that might have, have occurred due to COVID. And uh, we, we, do need, we do have a need to try to apply that evenly and equitably and to provide it uh, also universally. We've seen this, our students who, who have had bad years historically, especially those that were, that whose, whose families did not uh, have college degrees, were far more likely to, to get knocked off track and never complete college when they've, when they've had one or two bad crises. There have been large studies about that. There's a book out by one of, the, one of our, uh, an MIT economist right now that talks about that. And uh, we are, we wanna, we wanna, we want people to take it seriously when they see that students are in a bad place academically, that students, that, especially students that, that used to be successful suddenly are no longer successful. And we are just trying to figure out how to negotiate our way through all those, uh, through that thicket. So, so yay, I, I, think, I think that's good enough. I, um, I've spoken long enough to tell people about our, our problems and I love to, love to hear that any of these suggestions for solutions. Thank you, Bob. Um, so we have three more presentations coming. And if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. And Bob, I think there's some questions in the chat for you as well, if you can respond to it. And we're gonna move on to the next uh, presentation. Jen? The focus of this presentation is, oh, can you go back one more? I was gonna start. Um, is the K-12 perspective. But before I dive in, I do have to give a huge shout out to Sarah Quesson. I was originally planning to do this presentation and had a conflict. So Sarah stepped in and did all the research and created the slides. And then she had a last minute conflict. So I'm presenting her slides and she really did all the hard work. So thank you, Sarah. Next slide. Unchartered waters. 
When Sarah sent these slides to me, I was trying to guess who she was um, quoting here with, I've never tried to equate during a pandemic. A few months ago, a TAC member gave me that response when I was pressing for more concrete recommendations around spring 21 equating plans. But when I asked Sarah, she was quoting herself based on a conversation she had around schedules and estimating durations for equating during a pandemic. And really, I think we all could say this, right? None of us have equated during a pandemic before. And we're trying to be proactive and thoughtful in making spring 21 equating plans as best we can. But like Bob said, the reality is that we really don't know how things are gonna shake out. But a few things I wanna highlight about spring 21 um, challenges faced by teachers and students may be unevenly distributed across state, district, schools, or even classes within a school. So you might have a school who's been minimally impacted, students have been in school for the most part, or you might have a school that has been remote either the entire school year or part of the school year, or maybe they have some students learning at home and some students um, in person. Or you may have these classes that are quarantined here and there and one class is out for two weeks and then another class is out another two weeks and so students are experiencing all kinds of different experiences this school year. And this leads to opportunity to learn issues, right? It could be that we see differences across the board in all content that's being measured or it could be that there are certain parts of the content that are being missed, or maybe it's easier to learn remotely on some topics. Um, it could be differential from that perspective as well. In spring 21, accountability may be relaxed. And so that's a difference um, compared to past years. This could possibly make opt-outs higher or just the pandemic itself could increase opt-outs if people aren't comfortable coming in to test in person. And then oftentimes field testing, we wanna field test in operational environments, but spring 21 probably isn't gonna be an ideal time to field test, but there are states that have to. They need to have items to build future forms. And so we have to figure out a way to field test in spring 21. Next slide. The most important question to be answered by an assessment program at any time, and particularly this time, is what is the purpose and or intended use of scores? Testing was canceled in 2020 for all 50 states and for many states, 2021 is going to look different. Is the blueprint the same? And we touched on this uh, a little bit before, yeah, you did, about the blueprints possibly changing, and this could be operational or field test changing. So it could be a reduction in the number of operational items students are getting. It could be the removal of field test items that students, you know, normally they take 90 minutes worth of items and they're only gonna take 75. Changes in the blueprint could take either um, form. And then is the test administration plan the same? Are students testing in person as they normally would in the same number of sessions or are they testing from home? And I touched on this earlier, will opt-out rates be higher? And could this be certain groups of students that have higher opt-out rates than others? And then are scores being used for growth and or accountability? Like I said before, how we're using these scores is critical in developing our spring 21 equating plans. Next slide. So these next few slides I have broken up between pre-equating, post-equating, and then field test equating. So talking about pre-equating, this seems to be the recommendation in general from the field. If you can pre-equate, pre-equate in spring 21. And some states are also including a post-equating check. And this could be done at two different points in time, either prior to reporting or after reporting. And I would argue that if you feel confident in your item parameter estimates for pre-equating, that's how you should report. And then leave the post-equating check for after the administration and have it be more of a research um, approach. Otherwise, you might get into a situation where your pre and post-equating results differ. How much is a impactful difference and deciding what to do prior to reporting would be challenging. One benefit of pre-equating is it allows for faster reporting. So while some states have an extended testing window to allow for the flexibility of schools starting late or experiencing disruptions, pre-equating could make up some time in the schedule and get reports out as quickly as possible. Next slide. But there are some states who cannot 
pre-equate. And so they are having to find a post-equating solution. And the critical thing about post-equating is doing your equating on a sample that's similar to the base scale population. So as normal, we would wanna make sure that we have the demographics, district setting, special populations, and et cetera, matching the state um, population. Some states also match on a prior year's ability to make sure they have a sample that spans the ability distribution, but students didn't test in 2020. So that's another challenge, not having that data point. Um, you could go back two years, not for third and fourth grade, obviously, and high school could be challenging. So one possible solution might be just to use um, school historical data as a proxy for um, ability levels. And Bob mentioned that um, states are collecting attendance data and or end of test survey responses. And I think that's great. And I think we need to be doing that. I'm concerned about the completeness of the data and accuracy, um, but that's gonna be a new data point potentially in equating that we haven't dealt with. And so how to incorporate that data, um, I think it's important to think about prior to getting in the middle of equating. And then we have the remote testers. If a student or if a state has a remote testing option, should they be included in the equating sample or should they just be removed altogether? And some large states use early equating samples for uh, conducting their equating so that the schedule can be condensed and reports can get out as soon as possible. But with spring 21, where we really don't know what's going to happen, it may be important to wait until the majority of students have tested so we can be sure to get a representative sample. And this is gonna cause problems, um, especially with the extended testing window and additional psychometric work that we'll be doing. Next slide. With post-equating, you have anchor items and many state assessments use internal anchor items to put the items on the scale. And we may see considerable drift. We may not, right? But we may see considerable drift. And I'm curious if this is going to be across all content or is it going to be there are certain areas that we're seeing larger drift. And so we'll have to keep a really close eye on um, not only if there is drift, but which items are being flagged. And one potential solution um, is to have all prior operational items be considered for anchors. So normally we go into equating and we say, hey, here's our anchor set. This is what we're going to use. But instead, have consider all operational items, evaluate the drift, eliminate the items that have um, drift, and then from that set, select a, an anchor set that is representative from a content perspective. So really go into it, go into your equating and then figure out what your anchor set should be um, once you can evaluate the drift. And then another uh, logistical practical issue will be how to um, bank the 2021 post-equated item parameter estimate. So some states bank the item stats every year, some only do it the first operational year. So it will be important to be able to keep track of those if you do bank them, somehow flagging them to make sure, hey, we not, might not feel great about these item parameter estimates to be used for pre-equating um, and keeping all that separate. Next slide. So moving on to field test equating, many states field test plans have remained unchanged in terms of administering it. Some have reduced the number of forms anticipating um, higher opt-out, but it's often still there. And some have even increased to recover from 2020 loss, but common item non-equivalent group field test equating design relies on operational items for the scale. And if we don't feel great about the operational equating, then we're not gonna feel great about the field test equating. And so what should we do with the item parameter estimates from the 2021 field test? Maybe we can indicate that they're sufficient for item tryout purposes, data review and test construction purposes, but we wouldn't want to use them for pre-equating. And again, keeping track of that in your item bank so that when you go to test construction, you know um, how these item parameter estimates can be used. And then just a note here, most states are not changing the blueprint, but a few have pulled uh, field testing. Next slide. 
A few additional considerations. Um, did all students have equal access to instruction or were some subpopulations differentially disadvantaged? So if a school went remote, were there some that didn't have access to internet or parental support was different or the at-home learning environment, they had brothers and sisters all over the place. Just thinking about the experiences of students during that remote learning time. And this one, uh, the op next one, the open-ended one is one of something I'm really interested in. When we're talking about human scoring, oftentimes we compare the score distributions across admins, right? And the scoring team has validity and reliability procedures in place to make sure that scoring is consistent. But we still look at the item distribution when we get the data and are like, all right, last year we had 10% zeros. This year we have 11% zeros. We feel like the scoring was consistent and that nothing had changed. But if we're expecting students not to do as well this year, if we see 20% zeros, are we concerned that it's, there could be something going on with scoring or is it all attributed to student differences? So one thing that uh, you could consider doing is taking responses from a previous administration, take a couple hundred of them, and send them through the current year's scoring and you can see, all right, a paper that got a two in 2019 also got a two in 2021. And so we feel good, summarize those stats and, and see what the agreement is to make sure that in, any differences you see aren't um, due to any differences in scoring. And then many tests administered in 2021 were built in 2019. And so much of our world has changed in the last year, right? So we need to watch for bias and sensitivity issues with the older items, anything related to disease or vaccines or anything like that. And mode effects. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm curious about how this one will shake out. Over the past year, a lot of students have had more interaction with technology, arguably, doing more assignments and, and testing, and they may be getting more comfortable in writing essays or responding to questions online. So maybe in spring 19, the mode differences you saw between paper and online, they may decrease in 2021. I don't know, I'm curious um, to take a look at that. And then we may see increased opt-out rates if parents and or students are hesitant to test in person. If students aren't given a remote testing option and they have chosen to do remote learning, the there may be um, resistance to going into the school to, for testing purposes. Next slide. 2022 and beyond, we've been focusing on 2021, but the impacts could be um, beyond um, 22 even. And it will likely take a while for students to recover from learning loss and other COVID effects. Test construction timelines may be tight due to ex uh, um, extended testing windows and additional psychometric work required in spring 21. And we may be working with items that we don't feel comfortable pre-equating with. And so we will be back in a situation where we need to post-equate again for a program that may be typically pre-equated. And this last bullet is related um, to content more but item development plans are often established and let's say, for example, um, the lit passage is rotated off every couple years. And so you have this plan, um, multi-year plan and item development is based off of that, right? Like which items do we need to be pulling onto our forms which years? And if we're going to be changing up that anchoring and changing up which items um, we're swapping out, that could impact the item development plan. So it's important that psychometrics and content are in sync on that. Next slide. A few final thoughts. Hopefully this presentation challenged your thinking around equating in a pandemic and provided some potential um, solutions. A few recommendations that I would like to stress first, First, lean on our technical advisory committees for support. They haven't equated during a pandemic either, but hopefully walking through potential challenges and solutions will put us in a better position for spring 21 equating. 
Secondly, detailed specifications and careful documentation of decisions made during equating are a must. It's going to be a crazy spring and the data we get, we're going to want to slice and dice it a million ways and we're going to be under these tight time constraints and so it's going to be even more critical to be documenting all decisions. And then finally, I would encourage everyone to research and then present and publish your findings. We're going to have so much data and opportunities for looking at the impacts in spring 21 that I just really want to encourage everyone to um, share their research and results. Thanks, Ia. Thank you. A lot of, um, a lot of thought-provoking ideas. Um, I especially like uh, the plea to the field around uh, more research and publish your findings because of the richness of the data we will be able to uh, collect. Our next presenter is Amanda, um, and she's going to focus on the equating challenges we see with the licensing, a licensure certification field. Take away, Amanda. All right, thank you, Ia. So what I'm going to talk about today, a little bit different angle than you've heard from Bob and Jen. Um, I'm focusing more on licensure and certification, although a lot of what I'll say will overlap with what Jen just said. Um, so some of those I may go over a little bit quicker and really focus on some of the differences between licensure and certification versus education and some of the uniqueness there. Next slide. Thanks. So some of the things that are unique to licensure and certification, and I'll say unique in that I'm sure it also affects education as well. Um, but one of the things we definitely have to focus on are some of the practical constraints and requirements. For example, um, in professional credentialing, that need for immediate scoring is there. So candidates need to know what they're, if they're going to pass or fail. Sometimes delayed scoring is OK, but on a regular basis, you see that immediate scoring happening. There's also on professional credentialing, licensure certification exams, the focus on the pass fail decisions. Um, again, people need a job. So that pass fail is the focus versus the continuum of the score distribution. The representativeness of the sample also is extremely important when you're doing the equating, whether it's in education, obviously, or certification and licensure um, sample sizes, and making sure the exam is available to all candidates during the pandemic. I mean, in education, yes, there are certain states that maybe they chose not to give the exam um, during the pandemic, but with licensure and certification, you can't just have some states say, well, we're not going to give the exam, other states can. not Everybody has to be offered the opportunity, especially if it's going to be for a job. Um, and again, licensure and certification, that primary purpose is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So those comparability of results is absolutely crucial. And then just some high level differences, obviously education, it's students versus in licensure and certification, you have adults, different part in their edu education versus your inner career path. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is just the whole anything that you do to change an exam is going to affect the validity and affect your score interpretation. So whether it's affecting your design or your content development, shortening the exam, you're equating, everything can have an impact on the validity of your score interpretation. Okay. So I'm just gonna, you can click one more time, please, Ia. No, no, forward, and then just click one more time. There, thank you. So there are several factors that can impact equating. Um, I'm just gonna name a few, just blueprint updates, test spec changes, new test administration methods. And I will also preface this by saying, some of the things I've focused on talking about today are based on questions that programs I've worked with have had. And I talked with other psychometricians and asked for questions that they've had from their programs in terms of equating during this time. And one of the common things that's come up is the programs, they need to change their test spec, maybe shorten it a little bit to fit into that remote proctoring um, situation. So that's where the new test administration method has also come up. And as you go through the equating, I'm not going to go into details here, but things to keep in mind are those for equating properties, talked about in Colin and Brennan or in Lord, that symmetry property, if you equate one way, you should be able to go back the other way. Invariance, obviously really important here when you're talking about a remote proctoring candidates versus test center, it shouldn't matter which candidate, you're, which group is taking the test, you should be able to get similar parameters. Same test specifications, that's very important here because there are groups that are changing their test specs or at least the blueprint trying to proportionally shorten it. And then equity, it shouldn't matter where they take the exam. 
whether they take it in a remote proctoring environment or a test center, they should have the same experience and the interpretation of the score, regardless of where they've taken the test needs to be the same. So just taking a step back, we've already heard about this, but just kind of putting things into perspective, how things have changed and how that may impact us, a professional credentialing or licensure or certification exam. Businesses and schools closed virtual and then you went virtual causing changes in how learning occurred. That could have a direct impact on the pass rate of an exam. Testing centers closed, then they may have opened with limited capacity. This put jobs on hold and people had to re-prepare to take an exam at a later time. Again, perhaps it could cause the pass rate decline because they had to wait when they were already prepared or perhaps it's a pass rate increase because they had more time to prepare. So things to think about, it does affect the population a little bit. And also there have been adjustments to deadlines and the remote proctoring option, which has led to redesign of exams and process changes of which we'll talk about a little bit more. Next slide, please. Okay, next one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm go back up. Thank you. Many candidates also tested later than they originally planned um, and potentially into test different testing environment. This could cause angst or uncertainty for candidates, again, having an impact on that population taking the test. Um, just some other obvious changes, but I think they should be said, people that are in a test center now, they don't have to wear a mask when they're taking the test. It's a difference, a physical difference. Um, where if they're remote proctoring, they don't have that. Um, and then one thing that has not changed, there's a need for licensed and certified professionals. That continues to go on. So I'm going to talk about each of these, the proctoring method, test specifications, comparability studies, and equating plans. And throughout, I'll just mention the importance of documentation. So for the first for proctoring method, I'd argue to say the proctoring method, that's not the equating issue. The issue is the data that comes as a result of the different proctoring methods that are used. So by the fact that people are taking exams in different areas, you have some construct irrelevant variance that is happening and that could lead to incomparable scores. So it's looking at the data that is the issue that's coming out of these different proctoring methods. Next slide. So how do you remove that construct irrelevant variance when you're talking about different proctoring methods? Again, this is something that's come up a lot in my experience with the certification and licensure and with other psychometricians in this area that I've spoken with. When you're assessing the comparability of scores from different proct proctoring methods, there are all sorts of confounding variables that you had to account for to know whether or not the proctoring method is having an impact. If you don't take in those extra facts, factors, your results could be biased. So it's really important to consider all the different effects, all the different confounding variables that can impact the equating. In licensure and certification, that can be challenging, especially if you're talking about demographic factors, because often demographic factors are, are either not collected by the program or there's some privacy issues, especially if they're a global exam, and some of those demographics cannot be gathered. So that makes it a little more challenging to figure out which confounding variables are actually going to be an impact. There's also very few studies, as Jen was just talking about, that currently compare remote proctoring to test center because we haven't been in a pandemic before. Um, as I was looking through, there is a study from 2017 from Weiner and Hertz who actually did a study on remote proctoring versus test center where they had candidates show up and then they were either given remote proctored or test center. They didn't know which one when they showed up. Um, they found no difference in the performance. A little bit difference now is that candidates can choose which one they take, but um, there is at least one study out there and it does show promising results. Next slide, please. Okay. One of the other questions that has often come up in terms of proctoring methods is programs, how do we maintain our accreditation? So ANAB and NCCA are some of the most common accreditation organizations, both of which have started accepting remote proctoring. And the key there is just a document. Document, document, document. Document what you're doing, document why you're doing it, the rationales, your threats, and how you've addressed those threats. So the more evidence you have to say that what you're doing is, um, is helps make the valid interpretation of your test score, the better you are. And I would just encourage you, if you are an organization or you work with an organization who is accredited, they all have documentation that you can look at to make sure that you're meeting their 
their standards. The next thing that's come up um, with our organizations are changes in the test specifications. Again, as test specs, a lot of times what I've been seeing with programs and hearing is our tests are too long. Some of these licensure and certification exams can be three hours or four hours long. And when you go to remote proctoring, that's just, that's a long time to be doing in a remote proctored situation. So when they reduce it, the most important thing, again, is to document your empirical evidence of how you're, you're keeping that comparability of the forms. And if you are changing things, assess the extent to which the properties of equating are still holding. Next. So there's a couple of questions I'm going to address. One of them that's come up is how does a change to forward only testing impact the equivalence of forms? If you're not familiar with this, what I mean is if you do a paper pencil test, for example, you can go back and forth all you want on the test. You can skip items and go back. It doesn't matter. Same on computer-based testing. In some programs, the same thing can happen. But what's happened now with remote proctoring is when you take a break, that break is unproctored. So candidates have less, I'll use the word proctoring for lack of a better word, during that break time than they do in a test center. So what some programs are starting to do is to do a forward only. So either by item by item, once a candidate takes a test, an, an item, they can't go back, or after a break, they can't go back. Either way, if they've made a change, they're making a fundamentally different testing experience. The extent to which that's a different testing experience, that's something that you'd have to find out to see if that's impacting your data. So you could do a comparability study to assess that. Um, if there's truly a difference in performance, again, to what extent is that due to item difficulty versus the testing experience? If it's just testing experience, will that difference fade over time? Um, I did look just for reference. I went back and looked at some studies that compared paper-based testing to forward-only computer-based testing. Same similar situation to what we're facing now, they did not find any differences in performance. Okay, so these, I have 11 questions here. I'm not gonna provide answers, but just kind of give you some questions to think about. So one, if you're shortening an exam, to what extent did the content of the test blueprint change? Another thing, if the number of items on the exam, are they proportionally reduced according to the blueprint or did you just take out sections? Were the statistical properties of the reduced forms comparable to the pre-COVID forms? Was the exam time appropriately adjusted? If your exam wasn't uh, time before, is it, is it time limiting now? Did the presentation of items remain standardized? In other words, is someone that's in a test center and one that's remote proctored, are they having the same testing experience on their screen? Are they still seeing one item per screen? Does someone have to scroll and someone else not have to scroll? Is that testing experience the same? Has the interpretation of the score changed at all due to shortening the exam? How much shorter is the exam than the original one? The, the, the more of a change you have, the more it could affect your, your equating and your interpretation of the score. Is the shortening removing any redundancies or is it removing essential measurement opportunities? Okay. And then the last three, is the sample completing the reduced length exam representative of the population? If you're gonna use that data for equating, you want it to be representative of your population. Were the stakeholders given sufficient notice of the change? If your candidates are taking a changed exam and they didn't know it was changing, you got a problem there. So you're gonna have data that's not as you may have expected if they had known of the change. And another question to think about is which is more acceptable and appropriate for purposes of maintaining an equivalent interpretation of the pass fail score? Judgment error from conducting a new standard setting study if it cha has changed a lot or equating error resulting from changes in the test specifications. Okay, the next thing is comparability studies. I don't know that I'll go into a lot of detail here. I have a few slides on here, but again, the purpose is to see are there differences in your exam and how to compare them. Again, it's evidence to support the interpretation of the score and for fairness. 
So I have a slide here. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but what this is illustrating, it could look like equating designs, but this is really a comparability design slides. In A, B, C, and D, you have the orange represents test center candidates, the green represents remote proctor candidates. In A, you have both sets of people taking the same exam, and you're, you can directly compare that, versus in B, there's an overlap of some items. In C, you have no overlap of items, and then in D, which in, is really not very practical, but you could have both a test center remote proctoring take take each of two different, take the exam in the different conditions. Um, for each of these, we don't have time to go through it now, but I would ask you to think about there's a give and take in terms of security. The more overlap you have, the more security and item exposure. And then there's also the idea of being able to directly compare. And option B, where you have an overlap, you can have a direct comparison of a set of items of those that took it in a test center versus remote proctored. And that gives you an idea of the difference in performance in terms of the two proctoring methods. It could be explained by other factors, um, but at least gives you some overlap to look at. And then this is a comparability study for test specification changes. Again, how do you design a comparability study to determine if changes to the spe test specs will impact equating? What well, you could have the same group of people take both the original form and the revised form. I think practically speaking, that would have happened if you had people retaking the exam. Say they failed the exam the first time and they need to retake it. You have a retest effect you have to account for, but that's one way you could look at it. Comparability, again, you could look at a set of common items or an option C, you could have different forms and no common items, but again, you, you lose some of, by not having overlap, you lose some of the comparability. Some of the, just in general and comparability, you can look at historical item performance. How did they perform in the past? How is it performing now? You can look at pass rates. Pass rates, you have to you know, consider a lot of different factors during this pandemic, but are they reasonable? And again, as I said before, just document. It's a defensibility thing. The more you document, the more you're going to make your program defensible, and you can actually think through the rationales and make sure that you, your score interpretation, again, is valid. And then finally, equating plans. Again, documenting that plan. Consider the stability, representativeness, and statistical characteristics of your anchor items. And as Jen was saying all, uh, earlier, do a reasonableness check on your results. So just a couple things to think about questions I'm just going to pose to you. Uh, for sample sizes, is the sample representative of the population? Um, how large is your standard error of equating? For unexpected changes in performance, what changed? Uh, was your data clean for just valid attempts? Especially with remote proctoring, you could have some invalid attempts for whatever, you know, for outages or whatever that might happen more often in a remote proctored situation. Is that data cleaned out? Um, is chain equating used? If so, maybe chain back to a year pre-pandemic and make sure you're getting the same type of cut score. In terms of an anchor block, look at those anchor items. As Jen was saying earlier too, you can compare them and make sure they're performing as expected. I'd also recommend looking at some of those item, anchor items, making sure they don't have any COVID sensitive uh, content. In terms of pre-test data, Jen also mentioned this, is the data reliable? Look at your operational data. If you think that's trustworthy, then your pretest data is probably trustworthy. If it's not, that operational is not, then your pretest probably is not trustworthy. Um, delayed scoring, can you do it? If you're in licensure and certification, have you told your stakeholders there are going to be a delay in scoring? If so, that allows you to do a reasonableness check. And also, as Jen said, research. <laughs> More research. We, we need that. We're in that. Um, time where we're all experiencing something new and we really need to share what we can learn with each other. And again, just do what you can to document the validity of your score interpretation. So finally, real, real quick, just some steps to think about when you're making an equating plan, clean the data, identify those factors that could impact construct irrelevant variance, conduct whatever comparability studies you can, do your equating and do a reasonableness check, document, and then monitor.
And then again, just wrapping it up with that validity wheel, the goal of licensure and certification programs remains unchanged. We're trying to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So programs should take the appropriate actions to ensure the validity of the score interpretation remains consistent through any changes, whether it's due to the pandemic or otherwise. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, let me get Mike's um, slide deck situated here. Um, this is a PDF, so I'm just going to show it like this. I hope it shows up okay. Mike, take it away. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I went on uh, mute. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank I just you. To, okay, I'll start. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, I, th I thought just one, one quick comment. The uh, three presentations we just heard were, were just wonderful, comprehensive, and, and dealt with so many issues. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought, what a, what a really useful and wonderful session this is going to be, at least up till now. Um, so anyway, thank the presenters. This was re really a wonderful presentations. And it's interesting, I had seen the slides ahead of time, but, I, but listening to the presentations was really uh, added a tremendous amount. Um, so, so thanks. What I'll be doing in this, uh, in, in this uh, talk is I'll give some of my views on equating and, and, and how it's affected by COVID. And I'm, I'm gonna focus on K through 12, and then I'll talk about the three presentations and talk when I talk about, uh, and I'll talk about um, uh, certification licensure at that point. Okay, next. Okay. I think everybody here, since you're in the session, knows what equating is, but I'll kind of give you my rendition. And uh, so equating is a statistical process that adjusts scores on test forms with the goal that the scores on the forms can use, be used interchangeably. And I think this interchangeable use is what sets equating apart from any other kind of linking procedure that one might want to use. And, and if and that's really our goal. We're trying to come up with these interchangeable scores and equating is really the only way you can do that um, in terms of linking methods. However, in order, to cut, in order to come up with interchangeable scores, you need to have certain features of your assessment situation held fixed. And these, are, these would be the forms need to be built to, to be similar in content and difficulty. We usually do that with, uh, with detailed test specifications, both content and statistical. Um, the conditions of measurement need to, in order to, again, to get interchangeable scores, the conditions of measurement need to be similar for forms that are administered. By conditions of measurement, I mean things like stakes and administration mode, and you could probably list a whole bunch of these, but those are a couple examples. And the third is that the population of examinees taking the forms are similar to the target population in achievement and demographics. So it's a pretty heavy uh, set of uh, requirements or that, that you need to have in order to, to do equating and come up with scores that are actually can be used interchangeably. Okay, next. Now, our COVID situation has really you know, we're really in a situation where with COVID that's very complicated. Uh, things are every it seems like every aspect of testing almost is potentially changing. And so we, with con in terms of content and statistical specifications, a lot of states seem to be mon modifying content specifications based on opp opportunity to learn issues. Some states I think have, have decided that certain content is not going is not really featured. And, uh, and so it may be re might be removed from the test. The tests are also sometimes shortened. And I think Bob in his discussion talked a little bit about shortening with MCAS. Okay, so we've got a couple, thing, couple things associated with content statistical specifications that, uh, that, that, are, that appear to be changing. We have conditions of measurement. Now, one, the one thing that's probably gonna change possibly maybe quite a bit are the stakes associated with, with the assessments, especially the stakes uh, due to accountability 
being de-emphasized and potentially uh, having waivers to accountability. So that, that it, it, to the extent that accountability is even de-emphasized, we have a, you know, that's, that, that makes a potential major change to conditions of measurement. We also have situations, I think, where, where we have graduation requirements associated with tests. And in those cases, I think some states are considering waivers for, for 2021. Uh, and then another condition of measurement change in administration mode, such as remote testing. Again, these are all changes that, that may be occurring because of COVID. And finally, the examinee population. Uh, uh, likely there'll be a substantial number of students who don't test uh, possibly because you know, their, their instruction is outside of school and they might need to go into school to test. And, uh, in, the, in that, that, kind of situ, that kind of situation could cause the demographics of those tested to be quite different in 2021 than they were in 2019, say. Uh, the disruptions in learning could, these kinds of disruptions could lead to serious differences in achievement, both pre and post COVID. And the disruptions in learning can also differentially affect students from different groups. Uh, so, such as groups, SES groups, race groups, it seems as though there's at least some evidence, there is some evidence that there, these may be, there may be group differences in how COVID affects students and student learning. Now, all of these features would normally be fixed when you're doing equating. However, with COVID, we've got lots of changes in all the features, maybe all at once. And if, if that, when that happens, we may not be able to come up with interchangeable scores if we do attempt equating. Okay, next. Now, what is it you know, that we can do uh, and what would be a good thing to do given that situation, given that the, these circumstances? Well, one would be, you know, if, we're, if we don't think we can come up with interchangeable scores and high stakes uses of tests, may, we may wanna try to de-emphasize those. So if, if possible, you might try to obtain accountability waivers uh, for 2021, if possible, uh, because it, equating just may not work very well. Uh, and also what we might do is in 2021, I, I, I think it's really important that we do continue with our state level testing. And uh, you know the suggestions to drop it, I think are really short sighted, but, what we could do in 2021 is administer a previously equated form, say the one that was used in 2019. And that gives us a really good, uh, it's a good set of data to compare, um, compare what, what's happening in 2021 with, with what happened in 2019. And that, that may be the, actually the most useful aspect of the, uh, of the doing state, doing um, grade level tests in um, doing grade level tests uh, in 2021. Now, if, if, you not, if we can't give a whole, the whole form, we could probably at least give some items that are common from a previous form and, and use data on those items to, to understand what's going on with COVID and its effect on student learning. Um, okay, some of the analyses that we could look at would be, we could compare pre-COVID and 2021 scores and we could look at total scores, scores on sets of items from different content areas, scores on individual items. And I think to make these kinds of analyses most useful, we'd probably wanna consider some sort of matching on demographic variables to make the 2019 and 2021 groups of people uh, at least reasonably comparable. Um, you can also study differential COVID effects on examinee groups. And I think that's gonna be really important, including ethnicity, gender, and students with disabilities. And we might be able to also study COVID related effects of changes in the conditions of measurement, like such as administration modes and stakes. Okay, thanks, next. A uh, couple other points, one is that the data that we get in 2021 is probably gonna be really messy. And that includes field test data and, uh, and operational data. And it may be best if we could try to avoid using the 2021 data in future equatings and avoid using the field test data from 2021, uh, at least 
I wouldn't ex expect the parameter estimates to be, uh, to be very stable. Okay, so what we have here, we have lots of changes all at once. Uh, I think we're gonna need some sophisticated analyses to disentangle the effects of these changes. I think it's really important that we be, you know, plan now if we haven't started yet uh, for the kinds of analyses we wanna undertake. Okay, thanks, next. Okay, so that, that those were some kind of general comments and I, I don't think my general comments it all contradicted what we heard in, in the other three presentations. Maybe just gave you a different different kind of way of viewing them or structuring of viewing those kinds of issues. But now I'll go and talk a little bit about each of the uh, each of the presentations. Uh, uh, Bob Lee talked about issues associated with MCAS and in particular a whole bunch of different psychometric issues. Uh, he. One thing that I found really interesting was how, what is his description of what's changing from 19 to 21. And, you know, I'm sure, you know Massachusetts is probably, you know, maybe may, may at least if not representative of the nation, at least they're doing a lot of things that seem to be coming up elsewhere as well. Um, so what they, they're talking about doing is moving from post equating to pre equating. They're talking about cutting the test length in half changing the percent of items from different content categories that the distributions may change. And it looks like the instruction modes may change too. Uh, according to what he reported in fall of 2020, the instruction mode or 47% of the students were, were doing all remote. I imagine that's changed by now, but, uh, but I thought that was really interesting, quite a difference from, from past. Um, uh, present or discussed a, a really nice simulation study that showed how much increase in error there's going to be classification error uh, due to test shortening. And I, I thought it might be good if you could somehow quantify equating error as well and, and add that to the, uh, to the, to the um, error due to the error, the error due, due to um, shortening and, and yeah, and add that in. Um, Bob talked a lot of, or talked a lot about having plans to use growth percentiles to assess the effect of COVID on student growth measures. And I agree that that's going to be you know really valuable, important data. Um, I, I'm hoping that you're also going to look at some more status-based statistics as well, because sometimes they're a little easier to interpret. Um, especially if you can use some kind of matching of, of demographic matching of students. Um, an important question I think for uh, to, to try to get a handle on is how do all the, of the changes that are being made with MCAS uh, from 19, 2019 to 2021 affect equating if, it, if you are attempting it and how, how do they affect score comparability? We're likely going to be in a situation here and in other of places where you know we're, we're not really going to end up with interchangeable scores and if we can't get those then, then we can start talking about comparable scores and you know how comparable are they and uh, I think that that in this COVID situation I think that may be a, in some cases a, a, a more appropriate question than can we come up with equated scores in the sense of uh, using scores interchangeably. I also agreed with Bob that the MCAS score should be used to help understand the effects of COVID on student learning. And I'm hoping that, that you know, that's gonna be a focus throughout the country. Okay, next. Um, okay. Next presentation was by Sarah Kesson and Jen Beimers. And uh, really appreciated that, 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 that their discussion um, you know, brought up just a, a lot of different um, really important points and issues associated with equating and in, 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 in COVID, with COVID. Um, so it's, they, they discussed many of the changes that result from COVID that could be, affect equating. They talked about opportunity to learn, accountability, test specifications, field testing, and opt-out opt out rates. Uh, they also had, had a nice discussion of pre-equating versus post-equating, and they pointed out that compared to post-equating, pre-equating allows for faster reporting and no need to do item calibration in 2021. 
They also pointed out that post equating requires the use of item parameter estimates from 2021, which are likely affected by COVID. So, you know, there, there's a good argument to, to, to use uh, pre equating if possible. Um, However, they, they also talk about using pre-equating with a post-equating check, which I think if it can be done would be really worthwhile because you can then, um, you can see if then it, see if, uh, if, if there's some kind of interaction between uh, year, testing year and, uh, and items, uh, item difficulty. Uh, they also considered how field test item parameter estimates in 2021 may be affected by COVID and might not, and they might not be accurate if used for equating in 2022. And I thought their discussion uh, of the importance of research was right on. Uh, so anyway, very good, great presentation. I, you know, I think it's made, made, brought up a number of really key points. Okay, next one. And the third presentation was by Amanda Wolkowitz, and she was talking about uh, equating with COVID and, and credentialing and licensing. And she detailed over an overview, had a detailed overview of issues associated with equating and other comparability issues. And she had a good discussion of comparability studies and equating plans that includes uh, includes a discussion of quality control issues, which I think is you know, really important to consider. Uh, she stressed the uniqueness of equating issues in credentialing and licensing situations. And I, I thought the two things that stood out for me were the fact that you know, in, they're really interested in pass fail. Uh, and uh, you know, in K-12 testing, we may want to know whether somebody's uh, you know, passes or not, but the main, main in K-12 are really interested in scores all along the score scale. Whereas in, uh, in sort of credentialing and licensing, we're, the real focus is on pass fail. Uh, and the other characteristic that's, that I thought was really interesting was the very high stakes that are involved. I think we talk about high stakes in K-12, but uh, you know, in credentialing, it's, it's actually, you know, seems to be much higher, uh, typically. The population, she also pointed out that the populations of examinees may change due to time periods when the tests could not be administered, which can create some issues. Um, she mentioned that, or brought up the test specification changes and tests were, are sometimes shortened. And I was a little concerned about this given the very, the high stakes nature of the test. Um, you know, and I was just wanted to ask, and, may, and I'm sure Amanda can answer this, is why is test shortening necessary? Uh, and I've noticed in some circumstances, situations, uh, pro testing programs have, have basically collected some of the data that they used to collect um, it, it, during the test administration, they'll collect it um, during registration. This would include, you know, use of practice items, collections of background data, and, and, and that sort of thing. If those were collected during registration, you might be able to get some time back for, from administration. Uh, uh, she, Amanda also talked about remote pot proctoring, and um, and it seems to me it's probably it's likely going to be more workable with credentialing and licensing tests than with K through 12 tests, but even with credentialing and licensing tests, there still are security, comparability, and equity issues that I, I imagine need to be dealt with. And one other kind of question I have is, is, is it possible that we would get different equating results for tests administered under remote proctoring compared to under test center proctoring? Lots of question, comparability questions like that, that, that we really need to get answers to. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciated the, uh, the three presentations and uh, you know, I thought this was a wonderful session. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have a couple of more minutes left and I see a question in the chat about pre-equating versus post-equating and why we would, um, and what's, where would you recommend pre-equating versus where you would recommend post-equating, um, as well as another point around uh, 
um, pre-equating with a post-equating check kind of in between the two models. I don't know if any of our presenters want to comment on um, what you all think with this particular model. Anybody? I mean, I know what my opinions are. Jen, you wanna? Give it sure. A I think it's really important to think about where your item parameter estimates come from if you're pre-equating the end count, how they were administered, even item position. So is your field test just one chunk in the middle of your test or do you have it spread out? And your operational test you can take into account position effects. Um, so I really think you have to evaluate all of those things in making a decision about whether it's more appropriate to pre-equate or post-equate. Um, if you do feel confident in it, then I think you have to go with it with reporting. Um, that post equating check I do think is critical, but I, I'm struggling with how, if you do it before reporting, you've already made your case of why you feel like pre equating is the way to go. If you see something different, is post equating the right answer? If, if you thought that was the case, then you should have started out post equating from the start. Yeah, I think the key is whether the pre-equating results were actually like the parameters on those items were collected from a reasonable field testing condition and to how much confidence we have on that. And then, um, especially with the pandemic and thinking about the learning losses or materials the teachers are able to cover versus not able to cover and things like that. I think folks are more leaning towards, at least from what I'm seeing, folks are more leaning towards pre-equating this year. Um, uh, Mike, uh, Amanda, or Bob, I don't know if you guys have any comments in this regard as well. Well, well actually, normally I, I don't like pre-equating that much. Main, for a couple of reasons. One is it, it, it restricts you from, uh, you're not able to screen out items that are behaving differentially in, in a particular test state than they differentially compared to how they had, had, had uh, functioned before. So generally, I, I, I I don't like it for that reason. However, with in this COVID situation, we're, we're, we've got a, we've got a situation where we know there are going to be some interactions. Some of these items are going to behave differentially post-COVID than pre-COVID. And then the question is, what do you do with that? And and they say, and we know that these these things are all effects are always also going to be very unstable. And if you look at a, in the following year, you'll probably get a somewhat different effects. And so I, I actually think pre-equating is probably not a bad thing, but I do like the post in this context, but I do like Jen's idea of adding post-equating checks because it, it'll give you an idea certainly about what, whether there are those kinds of interactions and you'll have to figure out what to do with them, I guess. But uh, anyway, that's my view on it. I, so I'm curious, I like Mike. Jen, that you brought that up. Mike, would you recommend doing the check before reporting? Yeah, I would, if you can, yeah. And then what though? How big of a difference is, is something you should consider reevaluating your approach? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> and, I mean, it, it is the challenge, right? I, I think what, I mean, obviously we have to evaluate it and think it thorough. But one of the things we're really also hoping this year is to have quicker reporting. Mm -hmm. So we have that information in the parents' hands and teachers' hands. Um, with the uh, different states that we work with, and I think most states should do this, one of the states we work with, they actually are going to use the assessment results and identify kids who are in need and try to offer some summer school. Mm -hmm. Uh, learning opportunities for, for these kids. And so in that particular situation, we have to really speed up reporting. Um, so what, what would you do right in that situation? What would I do or Jen? Yeah. yeah I, 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 no, I think Jen. Jen makes a good point that with the pre-equating, I mean, if, if you're in these, COVID is putting us into really uh, difficult situations. And I think if there's a good reason to do pre-equating because it'll allow you to do what you're talking about, you know, to, you know, improve education of kids or identify kids who are struggling. Uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that probably outweighs some of the, uh, the, the concerns I might have about, about doing pre-equating. So I, I, I think it's a good point. 
Thank you, Micah. For those of you who don't know, Jen and I went, both went to Iowa, were trained uh, by Micah to do equating. <laughs> but they know more than I do at this point. About this oh, I don't know about future. that. I was trying to put all the blame on you. But <laughs> no, you've gone way beyond that instruction. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any, uh, we have like one minute left. Any other questions, um, folks, or lingering thoughts that you want to share? Okay, well, um, it's just great to see some of you and be able to see we have a great turnout today. Um, just another plug, we have um, scheduled another eight seminar or webinars coming up in the next eight weeks, starting 3.30 every Thursday. So hope to see all of you to continue to join us. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.